center. But finally, we have uh, everything set up, and it's my pleasure to introduce you, uh, Alex Stamatakis. I will be very brief. He has a long CV. He's been uh, doing research in many amazing topics related to, to high, uh, high throughput parallel computing and evolutionary calculations, in particular, the, the reconstructions of phylogenetic trees. And he has been working in different countries, including Greece, Germany, Switzerland, the States, France, and he also has been for some periods in Spain and he speaks perfectly Spanish. So with, with, without further ado, Alex, whenever you want, go ahead. Thank you very much. So thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, thank you for hosting me here. It's a pleasure to be back in Barcelona after 10 years. So unfortunately, you didn't pronounce my name the way the Spaniards typically pronounce it, like Estamatakis, but <laughs> so I couldn't make that joke. Um, just to give you an overview of what like the, the group set up uh, in my team is now before I start talking about research. So there's my kind of home group that I've been running since 2010, which is at the Heidelberg Institute for Theoretical Studies where we predominantly face on, uh, focus on method development. Then there is this new group here that is uh, funded by the uh, EU ERA chair program for the widening EU countries. So that's the official EU name for underdeveloped countries um, with a goal to establish like a new research direction um, in Greece and help to uh, counter brain drain and achieve brain gain, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'm also like, uh, so those are like the two labs I'm directing. And then with two friends of mine, we're also uh, trying to uh, run the ancient DNA lab that is also located in Iraklio, in Crete. Um, so this is a group. Those are like our new PhD students that uh, just arrived in Crete uh, beginning of February. And this is the rest of the group, both from Crete and Heidelberg here in front of the uh, building of our research institute in Heidelberg. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about bioinformatics. There are basically two ways to do bioinformatics, right? So one way of uh, conducting bioinformatics research is this kind of, you know, data-centric or data-focused approach where you generate data, you have some data, you use like the typical pipeline here, pointer doesn't seem to work, it doesn't matter, and then you produce a paper and, um, you know, this is basically not what we do. So being a computer scientist by training, we've always, until now, so it's changing a little bit now, but until now, we've really been doing method-centric bioinformatics. So we've really been focusing on the, you know, um, tool, uh, tool development. So basically every pipeline stage will uh, produce a paper here. Um, so that's kind of the setup. So we're mostly really method developers. And I'll, for those of you who may not know, I'll give a very brief introduction to phylogenetic inference. And then I'll talk about some kind of recent work, work we have been doing uh, here, a lot of machine learning, and then provide you in the end uh, an overview over some other projects we're currently working on. So if you look at the problem of building a phylogenetic tree as a computer scientist, the first thing you see is the combinatorial complexity of that problem, right? So you have for uh, three species or three sequences, you have one tree, and then you kind of build all possible unrooted binary trees with four species um, by just adding the new branch, um, yellow branch here to the existing uh, tree with uh, three species and so on and so forth. And you continue doing that, you continue enumerating all possible trees or constructing all possible tree topologies. And what happens is that you have this kind of super exponential explosion in the number of possible trees, right? And so if you have some optimality criterion to score those trees, be it likelihood, be it parsimony or whatever else, uh, you cannot find like the globally optimal tree because you would be waiting, uh, well, till the end of the planet Earth and still not know which the optimal tree is. Um, just to show this to you in numbers, so this is the exact number of possible unrooted tree topologies for a tree with 2,000 taxa, so it's something like uh, 10 to the power of 6,300. Um, so here you have all the digits, uh, all the trees that you would need to evaluate. Um, so if we start thinking about problem complexity, um, evidently, so if we have like, you know, some kind of uh, optimality criterion, we always try, want to strive and find the global maximum, and this is our tree space here, so down here, are the random trees and up here are the trees with like you know good scores 
whatever that means. And we need to devise some sort of heuristic search strategy in the hope that we get as close as we can to this kind of desired global maximum. Um, and, you know, typically what happens is for maximum likelihood or parsimony-based tree searches is that they always end up in some sort of local optima. Mm -hmm. And the bad thing is that we still don't have any, you know, mathematical theory available that tells us how far we are away from the global maximum, right? So we just end up in some global maximum without knowing how far the global maximum that we're striving for is actually away. Um, so, you know, one way of kind of trying to better explore this vast, enormous tree space is to initiate uh, tree searches from distinct starting trees, right? So you can build reasonable starting trees using some cheaper to compute criterion like parsimony and then start your searches from there, generate another starting tree in, a hope, in the hope that initiating the search of one of those starting trees will get you cl closer to the global maximum. Okay, so that's kind of basically, the, in short, the way uh, computer scientists views um, the phylogenetic tree search problem, right? So we kind of consider it as being in, like an optimization problem. Um, and now what we've been kind of worried about or thinking about recently is are the different sources of uncertainty in those data analysis pipelines. So if you take like a very simple uh, phylogenetic tree analysis pipeline, the way it maybe looked like uh, two decades ago, um, first we have to do some morphology assignment. And, you know, from my point of view, or maybe I don't know if there are any kind of methods with explicit mathematical criteria, but typically what you use for doing your orthology assignment are some sort of dirty ad hoc methods um, using all sorts of default thresholds and clustering thresholds and whatever. And there is basically no widely used uncertainty quantification approach, right? So you don't really have some underlying theory that allows you to quantify how certain or uncertain you are about your um, orthology assignment. Um, uh, then this kind of continues with multiple sequence alignments. We also use heuristics as for phylogenetic tree search, and th those are mostly also ad hoc methods. So in general, there's no widely used uncertainty quantification approach, except if you want to do Bayesian inference of alignments, which is super cool theoretically, but very, very slow. Um, but recently, um, you know, there was this muscle uh, five multiple sequence alignment tool that was introduced, which essentially has nothing to do, has got nothing to do with muscle. It's a re-implementation of this old PropCons multiple sequence alignment tool. Um, the cool thing here is that to like a certain degree, it allows us to cap capture the uncertainty uh, when reconstructing multiple sequence alignments. So basically it's still like the perturbation or the way the uncertainty is quantified is a little bit at hoc, but at least we can quantify uncertainty now. So um, what Rob actually does is that he kind of perturbs some HMMs and perturbs the guide trees along which uh, he recursively constructs the alignments. And so what, what this is, is basically that instead of just like creating a single monolithic alignment, he generates an ensemble of alignments, of plausible alignments. So it's a little bit like in weather forecasting, right? So you perturb a little bit the starting conditions and like for some time, <laughs> the, the, uh, <laughs> you get like a distribution or like an ensemble of possible weather configurations. And the same, uh, you get the same thing here with this muscle fiber, which I think is pretty cool because this was something that was missing. It al allows us to at least, you know, get a notion of the uncertainty with respect to the multiple sequence alignment. And then in phylogenetic inference, last part of our pipeline, well, we do fortunately have a long history of explicit uncertainty models and approaches. So we have like the classic non-parametric bootstrap when using maximum likelihood, or we can use posterior probabilities um, as sampled by, you know, Bayesian inference methods by uh, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. So that's good. So at least for phylogenetic trees, we've, uh, we do have uh, kind of, you know, theoretically well-founded uncertainty measures. Um, and so this is like, you know, a tree with support values. So they will tell us that, well, we're kind of, you know, more or less 80% certain um, that this uh, inner branch here uh, is correct. Okay, so basically to summarize those different sources of uncertainty, 
if we look at our pipelines, that we have uncertainty in orthology assignment that is not well captured. We have the uncertainty in multiple sequence alignment that can now be captured still by some sort of ad hoc sampling, but we can capture it. And we have all those kind of well-established methods for capturing uncertainty in the area of pre-inference. But then there are like other sources of uncertainty when analyzing data, and those refer to software issues. Um, and like our software is full of bugs, right? And we do have a lot of problems with the software quality, especially if you start like developing a code and it's getting used, you keep extending and extending and extending the tool until nobody uh, is able to maintain it. Um, especially with maximum likelihood or everything that is statistics and numerics, we have a problem with numerical stability or instability of the operations we do. Um, we have problems with reproducibility. I will not go into the details, but for instance, like if I'm executing a phylogenetic uh, tree inference under maximum likelihood and I run it on two cores versus on four cores, um, due to differences in the way the round of errors on the um, floating point numbers are being propagated, you may end up with a different tree if you have like a data set with a weak signal actually. Um, and then, um, so basically, you know, all those considerations led us to kind of redesign in the last couple of years, most of our, you know, most widely used uh, tools. Um, so we kind of redesigned and optimized them. So that's kind of the next generation tool series. There are a lot of tools called NG. So we've redesigned RedXML. We've redesigned a model test. We've redesigned the evolutionary replacement algorithm. So that basically allows you to kind of place a lot of, you know, environmental reads, anonymous reads onto a reference tree. And finally, we've also redesigned Lagrange, which is a tool for uh, basically biogeography or biogeographic ranges. Um, so basically here, the sources of uncertainty are the software issues. We have a lot of quality issues, issues with reproducibility. And then we also have this problem, like the final problem I'm going to address is that of actually propagating uncertainty, right? So imagine that basically at every pipeline stage, you can generate like a certain ensemble, maybe of, you know, 10 alternative solutions. So 10 alternative uh, orthology assignments per orthology assignment, 10 alternative multiple sequence alignments, so an ensemble of 10 uh, multiple sequence alignments. And then like uh, you already have like uh, basically 100 different input data sets for your phylogenetic inference. So basically the longer your pipeline is, the more the kind of complexity or the computationally computational uh, complexity that will be induced by propagating this uncertainty or those ensembles uh, will increase. So um, what we've tried to do recently is, you know, to have like some sort of more targeted approach for exploring this parameter space or for generating ensembles in those pipelines. So basically the idea is that maybe, you know, for, for, for a given bioinformatics operation, be it multiple sequence alignment or phylogenetic inference, and for a given data set, we want to try and predict whether, you know, this data set will yield a large ensemble of different outputs, or if this ensemble of different outputs will be very small. And um, yeah, that's basically what, what I'm going to talk about next. So one like first step toward this direction is kind of devising this idea of phylogenetic difficulty. Um, so yeah, as a disclaimer here, I actually never wanted to do machine learning um, because my argument always was that, you know, some people must remain that really want to work on discrete algorithms and high performance computing on archi hardware architectures. Uh, also, there should still be some C++ programmers and not the Python machine learning gang. Um, but now, like, the, the students have just changed. So in the computer science department in Karlsruhe, when I ask them what they're, they're interested in when they're looking for a master's thesis topic, it's always like, the same thing, right? I want to do something with data science and machine learning. So anyway, we're also doing machine learning now. Um, right. And so what we, we're kind of, you know, what we try to do with difficulty prediction or phylogenetic difficulty prediction is to figure out, well, you know, how kind of rugged our search space is. Or like, you know, if I initiate the search on different starting trees, will I, will my search heuristics always end up at more or less 
the same identical tree, or if I do like, you know, 100 heuristic searches starting from 100 distinct starting points, will I end up with different trees every time, right? So basically we're trying, essentially we're somehow trying to quantify or to predict the, the size of the ensemble uh, of, you know, plausible trees, so to say. Um, right, and, you know, first observation here is this is an empirical observation we've made over and over again, is that the difficulty of inferring a tree depends to a large extent on the shape of the multiple sequence alignment. Um, so here, if you think about data set shapes, um, here, you know, this is kind of a large alignment with maybe just single gene, RNA gene, or, you know, uh, coronavirus data. So you have a lot, huge number of sequences, but not like a sufficient number of base pairs or like uh, multiple sequence alignment sites. And then we have like those kind of, you know, large phylogenomic data sets, whole genome data, few sequences, very long um, sequence length. So, you know, I'm deliberately not talking about gene tree species tree incongruence. So if we assume that all those genes have evolved according to the species tree, then the signal in this kind of green good data set will be very strong and we'll get a very clear signal. Maybe for the wrong tree, if we start thinking about gene tree species tree discordance, but you know, just like the signal as such in those data sets is very, very strong. Um, right, and so basically, you know, the bottom line is that intuitively in this data set here, like in the bad red one, um, the, uh, we just have substantially less information for telling apart more sequences. Um, and of course, we also uh, observe that in practice, and this is somehow how, how this started. So people were just kind of you know, publishing single maximum likelihood trees from some search they did on the coronavirus data with some maximum likelihood search tool. So we kind of ranted a little bit. Uh, that's what, you know one thing that Greeks like to do a lot. And um, just said that phylogenetic analysis of COVID data is difficult. So people should be, you know, should think about ensembles of trees rather than just showing like the single coronavirus evolution tree. And so what we did, like in a nutshell, is that we assembled four distinct data sets. They were very small. So this was at the very beginning of the pandemic. They had like 2,000 or 4,000 sequences. And per data set, we executed 100 independent maximum likelihood tree searches that were initiated from different starting trees. And then we used well likelihood model. So this allows us to determine those trees among those 100 that we have produced among this kind of, in this ensemble of 100 trees that we've generated that are statistically not significantly different from each other. Basically trees that we cannot, you know, um, tell apart just by using standard kind of likelihood tests. And so it turned out that, well, for all those four coronavirus data sets, about 70 out of the 100 trees could not be distinguished statistically from each other, right? So they were kind of all more or less, uh, in a statistical sense, equally plausible. And now, now the bad news or like the shocking observation here is if you then took those 70 trees that you could not tell apart via statistical means, you would see that they're kind of topological, pairwise topological distance between those 70 trees on average amounted to 70%. So they are very, very different. Um, and so this is like the consequence of an extremely weak signal. The conclusion is that we should not draw conclusions just from a single tree if the phylogenetic analysis is difficult like that, or if the tree space is extremely rugged. And in that case, like if we have such a difficult data set, we should rather summarize the trees via summary statistics, so this ensemble of trees, rather than focusing just like on this one single tree that just happens to have a slightly higher likelihood than all the other 69 trees in this kind of uh, ensemble of trees. Okay, so this is basically a summarized tree, so consensus tree of this coronavirus data colored by country. Um, and well, so, so far, uh, where I want to get to now is that, well, you know, this kind of argument here, so this slide is 10 years old, until now was kind of very hand wavy, right? So we were talking about data set shapes and rock likelihood surfaces. So we tried to kind of quantify that. And now we can actually predict the difficulty of a phylogenetic analysis a priori. So given the multiple sequence alignment, we can tell you how easy or difficult this data set will be um, to analyze, so an easy data set evidently is that we take the MSA, 
Um, and then we do kind of, you know, the standard post-processing of the tree inference, and we get like just like this one unique tree topology, like a clear peak on this kind of va in this vast space of, uh, you know, possible and alternative tree topologies. So that's an easy data set where we have a very clear signal for one tree or maybe two or three trees that are topologically very close to each other. Um, difficult data set, this is not the case, um, as I've just outlined with the COVID example. So here, uh, you know, we, we will not get a clear answer. We will not get a clear signal for one tree. Um, so what does difficulty mean? Basically, we just define the difficulty as a value between zero and one. Zero means easy, and one actually means hopeless. So for easy data sets, we have few and very high, very similar tree topologies. We typically have like a single likelihood peak. And then for uh, difficult data sets, we have highly distinct uh, tree topologies, but like, you know, structurally distinct tree topologies that have however, cannot be distinguished by likelihood or by st any statistical means. And we typically observe like multiple likelihood peaks. That's what we call like, a, you know, kind of a rugged likelihood surface. Um, right. And so how does uh, Pythia work? Our tool here, so it's just kind of a relatively straightforward boosted tree regressor. We executed a supervised regression task. So to predict the difficulty between zero and one and to, uh, basically compute the ground truth values, uh, we used, you know, 100 or did, we executed 100 distinct maximum likelihood tree inferences on all the data sets we included in this study. So initially we trained on around 4,000 empirical multiple sequence alignments with a mean absolute error of 2.5%. And then we updated that. So basically we used more data sets and the, the absolute error also decreased so kind of standard machine learning stuff and so it seems to be you know our notion of difficulty or the difficulty prediction seems to be correct because for the coronavirus data set um we analyzed like well it was maybe three years ago we get a very high difficulty near 1.0 right so that's kind of more or less like a hopeless data set um so the interesting thing of course here is the uh you know are the features that we're we're using and of course, we somehow need to kind of capture the complexity and the ruggedness of this tree space. And we see like, if we look at the, at the feature importance and this kind of really one of the main points I wanna to make today, um, we see that, well, you know, this parsimony, so we do some pre-computations with parsimony that are much, much cheaper than likelihood. And those are our main features, right? Like accumulated feature importance of 76%. So parsimony seems to be very useful for kind of predicting stuff about likelihood-based inferences, right? So that's kind of the conclusion here. Um, okay, so that's basically the part, you know, about difficulty and how, how we set that up. So I will not go into the details of how we really define difficulty. Um, it's basically like, you know, the, the kind of the size of this kind of plausible tree set we get and the differences in tree topologies in this plausible tree set. Basically what I just, you know, mathematical formulation of what I just uh, explained here informally. Right, so now we have this kind of new tool of phylogenetic difficulty. How do we actually use it? Well, one thing here, like if you're using Pythia as an end user, is that you can use it prior to your tree inference, right? So you can, based on the difficulty, you can determine the analysis and the post-analysis setup. Will you have to somehow deal with a large ensemble of trees or is your data set so easy to analyze that basically just doing one maximum likelihood tree search will be sufficient to get a reliable tree? Um, it also allows you to somehow kind of, you know, get some feedback in the, um, in the data assembly process. So this is something we have not looked at yet, but basically like if you assemble a data set and you see that it has a very high difficulty and you have all those kind of different parameters in the, you know, data set assembly pipeline prior to the phylogenetic inference you can play with, you can maybe, you know, try to come up with a procedure that uh, attempts to optimize the, um, the difficulty, right, of your uh, input data set. So you can explore data filtering and assembly strategies. And of course, um, you can also adjust both user and reviewer expectations about the data, right? So kind of typical thing in phylogenetic analysis is that, well, people are totally um frustrated uh, that they're they have low bootstrap supports or maybe you know reviewers start complaining 
But then, you know, you can say that this is expected because we can quantify, we can predict why and explain to you why maybe the bootstrap support in a highly difficult data set will be that low. Um, right, so, and then, you know, using, uh, so this is like uh, using or deploying Pythia as an end user, but of course, uh, we're, we are also trying to deploy it as developers. So uh, what you can do if you do like, you know, studies on, on simulated data is that you can somehow take the difficulty into account and the difficulty distribution of data sets that people like the end users typically analyze can be taken into account. So um, just this kind of one, one graph here. So what we're showing here on the, um, on the X axis and all four plots is just the difficulty, right? So we have just kind of, you know, sample data sets with various degrees of difficulty such that hopefully they are somehow representative of what people analyze in practice. And then here we, um, on the respective Y axis, we just kind of uh, plot the log likelihood difference to the tree with the best maximum likelihood a score that we could find using any method, right? So, and what you see here is, is really interesting. So. You know, here's IQ tree and, and RaxML, so both kind of maximum likelihood tools, and evidently they are expected to perform best with respect to their kind of difference to the best maximum likelihood tree we were able to find. And so you can see here that basically they have a kind of a pretty stable performance over the entire difficulty range. However, now if you look at, you know, just kind of standard parsimony inference and also fast tree, which is something like an well, approximate, fast, likelihood-based inference program that does not try very hard to really optimize the likelihood, you can see that, well, you know, here in the corner, so where data sets are easy to analyze and where they are different, uh, difficult to analyze, they don't perform that much worse, right? So here they perform uh, well just because there's so much signal in the data, so parsimony or like a very kind of approximate method that takes a lot of computational shortcuts will um, perform equally well. And well, here, like for the hard cases or the hopeless data sets, the lack of signal is so large that, you know, it doesn't matter what you do, right? You get some tree that captures kind of some fraction of the signal and that's it, right? So the, in the hopeless cases, it doesn't really make a, a lot of sense to use maximum likelihood and to use a lot of computing power. Um, so basically th those observations from this kind of simulation study uh, we thought that then they can also, like difficulty can essentially be used or be injected into the heuristic search strategies um, to invest kind of less or more effort depending on the degree of difficulty of the data set. So this is kind of this new subversion of RaxML and G. We're going to kind of integrate it and make it the default tree search option uh, of RaxML pretty soon. Um, so here the idea is very simple, but that we have our, you know, uh, input multiple sequence alignment uh, for which we want to re, uh, infer a tree. And we, before we actually start this heuristic tree search, like our journey through this kind of gigantic tree space, we compute the difficulty score and we adapt our search strategy as a function of the difficulty score. Um, so once again, you know, we have the cases here. So we do this kind of very rough division like of the easy data sets that have a score between zero and three. 0.3 intermediate data sets, 0.3, and the hopeless data sets, 0.7 to 1.0. Uh, um, and so we use, we compute the difficulty score, and then basically as a function of this difficulty score, what we do is that we kind of adapt the number of independent maximum likelihood tree searches that we conduct. So again, if the data set is easy, maybe, you know, just carrying out like two or three independent tree searches from different starting trees will yield a stable result. And we also, I'll, I'll not go into the details, we also kind of adapt the thoroughness of the searches, right? Like how hard do we really try? How many CPU hours do we really invest into optimizing the likelihood at different stages? Um, so test data and setup uh, here. So evidently this was 10,000 and 5,000 in the beginning, then we had to do some filtering. So we used empirical uh, multiple sequence alignments from tree base and simulated ones as well. And once again, so for, for designing this kind
kind of study, this performance study of, of adaptive RaxML appropriately, we wanted to have like, you know, some sort of representative sampling of the difficulty space. So basically here, um, this is basically just the count of, of data sets we used or their frequency. And on the X axis, we have the difficulty interval ranging from zero to 1.0. So the blue bars here, this is actually the difficulty uh, distribution we get from tree base, right? So this is representative of the phylogenetic difficulty distribution in tree base, which is this large database of published multiple sequence alignments in trees. And we've tried to somehow like adapt our simulated data sets uh, to reflect kind of this kind of empirical difficult distribution that we do obtain from tree base. Um, so what did we do? Evidently, we were interested in the maximum likelihood scores of the trees we would get by running, like, you know, comparing standard RaxML search algorithm versus the adaptive uh, RaxML search algorithm that does take difficulty into account. So we just look at the, uh, you know, the best maximum likelihood tree that was found by RaxML and adaptive RaxML. And we see that, you know, um, in 95% of the cases, those two trees are not st uh, statistically significantly different from each other, right? So that's pretty good. And then in some cases, uh, the tree found by the kind of default standard search algorithm is significantly better than the uh, tree found by the adaptive algorithm and also the other way around. So both things happen. So, you know, you might argue that, well, standard Braxamol might be kind of a tiny bit better, but the differences overall are so small that I would tend to say that, you know, the differences in performance with respect to finding the tree with the best maximum likelihood score are uh, kind of negligible. Um, another pretty interesting thing here that, again, somehow highlights the, the impact of difficulty or the ruggedness of tree space is this plot here. So um, here on the x-axis, again, we have the difficulty of the data set analyzed. And here on the y-axis, we just plot the relative Robinson pools distance, so the topological distance, between the best tree that was found by RaxML and the best tree that was found by adaptive RaxML. And so this kind of really highlights this ruggedness of the search uh, space here, of the tree space. You know, with increasing difficulty, I get trees that have same likelihoods, but that are topologically very distinct. So here, you know, starting from a value of around, of course, there are some few outliers, but around 0 0.6, 0 0.7, it's like a total mess, right? You don't, you should never like just publish and show a single tree um, because the uh, search space is so rugged. Right, and then of course, like the, the thing that, you know, will probably most interest the computer scientists, those are now the speed ups of RaxML versus adaptive RaxML. Uh, and G, once again, we're kind of, um, you know, plotting the speed ups over the difficulty range here. Uh, so from zero here, the easy data sets, the intermediate data sets to the difficulty ones on the right hand side. And we get speed ups varying between like, you know, factor 10 to 15, so an order of magnitude, relatively small speed ups in the middle. So that's like those intermediate data sets are really where we need to invest some effort, efforts in maximum likelihood optimization. And then on the right hand side, like the difficult data sets, you know, the, the hopeless ones, you just don't, it doesn't make sense to um, invest any computational effort, right? So here on the left hand side, on the easy data sets, a higher search effort is just not required. And then on the right hand, hand side, the uh, doing like, you know, investing higher search effort or more CPU time just makes absolutely no sense. Um, right, and so just, you know, the summary of all that. So the overall accumulated speed up over all difficulty ranges here is uh, approximately factor of three, which is I think like a decent, decent improvement in runtimes. Okay. Um, how are we doing time-wise? Okay. So the other thing that we've started doing now, and this is kind of work in progress, is that we asked ourselves, well, you know, this kind of difficulty prediction worked well, and parsimony seems to be, you know, useful for predicting some characteristics or properties of the tree space under likelihood. Uh, why shouldn't we start uh, looking at bootstrapping, right? So, you know, for those not that familiar with phylogenetic inference, Bootstrapping is very compute intensive because you resample your data set and you have to do like 100 or 1000 maybe searches on those kind of 
bootstrap replicates of your multiple sequence alignment. And what the question we ask here is if we can predict bootstrap support values via machine learning. So basically we want to, via some machine learning magic, assign support values to all inner branches of the given tree. Um, so the way that works um, is like, so the tool is called Educated Bootstrap Guesser. Uh, we ha are given a maximum likelihood tree and we kind of, you know, ask our tool to, uh, to predict the support values on this tree here. So there are various flavors of the kind of, you know, values we predict, but I will not go into the details. And so the key input to this here, to our predictor, is that we're just generating 1,000 parsimony starting trees, right? So just on the original alignment. And then we're also doing like 200 uh, parsimony tree searches on bootstrap alignment. So, you know, the, the 200 and 1,000, this is just standard like trial and error uh, until you find a solution that is both kind of computationally efficient and sufficiently accurate. Um, and in any case, so here is parsimony again. And that's actually really the point I want to uh, to make here that parsimony is really useful even for predicting uh, bootstrap support values. So um, evidently the runtimes are interesting here again. So what we have is the multiple sequence alignment side that we just approximate by the number of sequences multiplied with the number of side patterns. So the number of unique columns in the multiple sequence alignment. And here, this is a, the, you know, um, well, the moving median essentially the time to, com of com to completion, you know, smooths a little bit. Just keep in mind that this is actually a logarithmic scale here. And um, what you see, this is kind of the standard uh, bootstrapping procedure as we would uh, execute it in RaxML. Um, so um, just doing maximum likelihood tree searches in every replicate. This is the uh, IQ tree ultra fast bootstrap approach, which is uh, pretty fast here. Uh, on DNA and uh, protein data. And th those are like the prediction times on a DNA and protein data for our new tool called uh, EVG. So we get like a median speed up of 8.7, once again, over a large collection of data sets that have been sampled in such a way that they reflect the difficulty of empirical data sets as we observe it in TreeBase. Um, the accuracy, and here, uh, here we're still trying to figure out what's going on. So this is the, you know, the branch support as inferred by the uh, different methods for computing branch support. And then this is the fraction of times that a branch with a support was actually in the true tree. So evidently here we're using simulated data. So ideally um, a method for, you know, with ideal branch support values should exactly follow this line here. So what we see is that our EBG predictions are pretty close to this line. Then a thing that is known, this kind of approximate likelihood ratio test, also a rapid method for computing supports, is kind of oscillates a lot and then is only kind of interpretable or useful uh, in this area of higher values. And this is kind of the, you know, UF boot performance here, right? So the closer I am to the red line, the better uh, my, um, you know, support value is. But uh, then we were actually looking at the, uh, the paper describing the UF boot, um, the UF boot method. And here we see that kind of UF boot actually performs much better than in our simulation experiments, right? And so this is something that we're uh, trying to figure out why this is the case. So it must be associated somehow with the way the data were actually simulated. Um, so what we did here when we simulated the data is that we used this other kind of tool uh, we developed recently, which is called uh, Raxamel Grove. So basically we're kind of, you know, uh, collecting data from the Raxamel web servers. So we're uh, collecting the tree topologies, the model parameters, not the multiple sequence alignments, to have like a representative set of trees, of empirical trees computed on empirical data, along which we can then simulate data in the hope that the, the simulations will be more realistic. So in any case here, we still need to figure out if it's due to the different way by which we simulate or if there's another reason for this kind of, you know, weird discrepancy between those kind of accuracy plots here and those ones here. Um, right. 
So yeah, I'll spare you the, the details on the empirical data. Um, generally, the, the, the correlation between the uh, predicted support values and the kind of standard support or gold standard, uh, standard maximum likelihood bootstrap support values. Um, if you look at the um, support values as plotted on the tree, and if you compute the Pearson correlation, it's pretty good above 0.9 or in most cases, but there are also some outliers occasionally here. So, um, you know, it's fair enough. Now, the point I actually wanted to make here, because this work is still a little bit premature, is again feature importance, right? So here, this is parsimony starting trees, I think, and that is parsimony bootstrap. So parsimony, again, uh, accounts for 85% of feature importance. So here we have confirmed our kind of intuition that we got from Pythia, from when developing Pythia and difficulty prediction, that this is kind of super useful um, for doing machine learning um, on likelihood-based methods. So I think that there will be kind of some sort of renaissance of parsimony as a predictor for likelihood. Um, how much time do I have left? Oh, around nine minutes. So quickly, like in the end, uh, kind of an overview of some other things we work on, um, we've seen that already, right? We probably know that simulated data suck. Uh, that's a very recent study. So basically what we did was to design like two independent classifiers with our friends here from uh, France. So we developed the classifier, they developed the classifier. And the idea was to, well, you know, if you simulate a multiple sequence alignment along a tree, can this classifier tell apart empirical data from simulated data? And yes, and it's very easy, like even with a not very involved machine learning approach, no deep learning or any of the advanced stuff, we do achieve a very high accuracy in telling apart simulated from empirical data. We kind of all knew that or had like an intuition for that, you know, over the years when developing tree inference programs, but now we have like some sort of, some way of kind of quantifying that or showing that there's really a problem and we need to come up with some methods for more for generating more realistic simulated data. Um, yeah, another thing that we're working on, so this is again like in this kind of context of quantifying uncertainty. Um, so there's a cool tool like after Pythia, um, then we work on Pandora. So this is also work in process, uh, this in progress. This was kind of motivated by the, you know, the stuff that's going on in the ancient DNA lab where typically you have your kind of data set of SNPs and with your ancient samples. And the first thing you always do is like to do some kind of dimensionality reduction approach, typically PCA or MDS. Um, but we don't trust the data that much. And typically, you know, the contribution of the components is, is very low to explain the variability, like below 1% of the first and second component. So now we're kind of, you know, doing some sort of, so Pandora actually implements bootstrapping on the SNPs to be able to quantify the, the, the variance of the placement of you know, individual samples in the PCA. So what you can see here, this is just an example. So first and second principal component. Um, this is data from uh, Chayonu individuals in Turkey from our collaborators in Ankara. And you can see here, so basically those are like two positions of the same sample in two you know, different bootstrap references. So you can see here, and this is the same, like those two are kind of popping around and those two, so this is the same sample, just in different bootstrap replicates. They are jumping around quite a lot as well. So um, in general, like if you're doing PCAs on, on something that can be kind of bootstrap, typically, you know, it's mostly in population genetics. I, I think that this will be a useful tool for not drawing overconfident conclusions when doing PCAs on the, uh, on the data. Um, another thing, so this is like the, you know, the other part of the title. Another thing that we're working on is, or finally started working on, uh, we intended to do that like for 10 or 15 years, is to look a little bit at what the linguists are doing when they're kind of reconstructing those language evolution trees. Um, so basically here, what we try to do is to eliminate a certain degree of subjectivity um, that they have or that they inject into the data when they assign the data set. So typically what they use is what, that they use cognate data 
So uh, Cognate data set basically, you know, relies on a list of concepts, of very universal concepts for which you have words in every language, like man, woman, hand, um, sea, and things like that, right? So those are the concepts. And basically, um, such a data set then has a word for each concept in every language. Um, but of course, there may be synonyms, and that's the problem here. So, and typically, like linguists would select like everyday words describing this concept, this list of basic concepts precisely. And you typically represent um, the data by a binary character matrix on which you then, uh, you know, just do ma standard maximum likelihood inference uh, using Rex MLNG or Bayesian inference or whatever. Um, but the problem really are the, um, you know, the uh, kind of the synonyms. So for, for big in English, we have big and great, but then, so big is not related, you know, in terms of uh, etymology to any other word in the other languages we're considering in this example, whereas great is related to the Germanic languages, and probably this is pronounced store or something like that. In the Scandinavian languages, so basically you break up this list of concepts you have here, uh, put a one here for big, big two then is great, that has the same kind of root in um, English, German, and Dutch, and then you have the uh, Scandinavian word here. So, and the question really is how do you handle those synonyms? And, um, right, so basically what linguists typically do, and that's where kind of the computer scientist totally freaks out, um, uh, is that, well, the traditional recommendation in linguistics, actually, is that one should just select the most frequently used word from the language and use that if you have synonyms. So this is like super work intensive because they are literally sitting there and selecting the words. And it's also totally subjective. And of course, you know, in, in languages like English or German or Spanish, you have like huge text corpora that you can just mine for the frequency of occurrence of words like big or great, but with dialects, with rare dialects, uh, you don't have like, you know, digital text corpora. So it's very difficult to come up with frequencies. And um, so there, you know, it, it, it's not a solution. And so basically um, what we tried to do here, like as a kind of first project there, we, um, while well, we somehow wanted to include all synonyms without any subjective choice, such that it's less labor intensive and less subjective, and incorporated that into phylogenetic likelihood models naturally. So I'll not go into the details. It's very straight. It's really very straightforward. Um, and it turns out that, uh, well, it works pretty well. So what you can see here is um, this, this is our new automated approach that kind of automates the way part of the work the linguists are doing. And uh, this is kind of the traditional method here. So basically, this is our approach where you just take those kind of um, the cognates and uh, directly integrate the synonyms into your model and you're done. Here, this is just like, you know, the median over kind of some random sampling of the synonyms, right? So we randomly just sample or resolve this kind of synonym selection problem 100 times and then generate, yeah, 100 trees. And then the cool thing here is, so those, this is kind of the median topological distance of the randomly sampled synonyms to the gold standard trees. So they have gold standard trees in uh, linguistics. And this is just the distance of our approach here. And you can see that, well, you know, there's essentially no difference, but you do get some outliers. And this is the median, right? So if you really do um, kind of the subjective choice badly, we can show that your tree can be actually way off. So, um, you know, this was kind of the first uh, approach to um, linguistics. The problem here is that the data sets are both small. So those lists of universal concepts is maybe like 300 or 400 concepts. Yeah. So you have a few alignment sites. And um, you, we also have like not enough data sets, right? So this is like 44 data sets, all kind of data sets you can find. Um, okay, so and this is probably the last thing I am going to show here since we are the supercomputing center. We also did some work on energy efficiency. So the key idea here is that basically the, the CO2 footprint of your computations uh, depends on the real-time energy mix in the electricity grid, right? And so actually the energy price uh, also like has this kind of one-to-one -one dependence 
on the um, you know fraction of renewables in the energy mix, right? The more renewables you have in the energy mix, the lower the electricity price is. Um, and so the key idea here is so we have this kind of correlation of um, uh, you know renewable energy in the energy mix with the price and evidently with the CO2 emission emissions of your computations. And so the idea is that basically we can kind of dynamically uh, and this data actually the fraction of renewables in the energy mix ooh, ooh, minutes are over um, is available by an API in real time. So basically we can just query um, the fraction of renewables in the energy mix. And if the fraction is low, we just lower the CPU clock frequency, thereby kind of lowering the uh, uh, electricity consumption, lowering essentially if you have like a real-time electricity price contract with an electricity co uh, company, uh, also lowering the electricity cost. And the cool thing here is, and this is the only thing I'm going to show, is that the, um, you know, so this is the power cap here. The CPU, just look at this graph here. This is kind of running at 100%. This is the CPU is running at 90% and 80%. And so this is not like a linear relationship here, right? Like in terms of the, uh, the performance or the slowdown you get. So um, basically if you uh, throttle down the CPU to 90% of, the, um, of its clock frequency, your jobs will maybe just experience on average, so this is like over a benchmark of many scientific applications, will maybe just experience a slowdown of 5%, right? And so there is this kind of gap between the linearity here of the, um, of the other metrics and the electricity prices and the, the program performance that we can exploit to kind of lower the CO2 footprint of our computations. Okay, I'll uh, stop talking here. Just wanted to mention that you know, I'm a computer scientist by training. I've also become a field biologist now. I'm kind of operating those insect uh, malaise traps myself now. Quite a fun experience. Um, I'll skip all the rest. This is our village in Crete. Thank you very much for your attention. Value. Could we split uh, the difficulty by the step that we are looking at, for instance, the difficulty of the orthology, the difficulty of the alignment? Mm, yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, right now we can just compute the difficulty of a phylogenetic inference given a multiple sequence alignment, right? So basically all, all prior pipeline or data analysis pipeline steps will, of course, somehow influence that difficulty. Um, but like indirectly, right? Because you can only just look at the phylogenetic difficulty given the multiple sequence line. So you kind of, you know, you play around with all the parameters before, like filtering, cleaning, whatever you want to do, and then see what the impact is on the phylogenetic difficulty. Something that I did not show here because this is very premature is that we're kind of you know, moving like back in the pipeline, we just had a master thesis finished where we're trying to somehow quantify the difficulty of the multiple sequence alignment problem itself, right? So, but that's the student that was doing the master thesis was not too good. So we have to figure out what he did and, and we'll probably continue working ourselves on that. Um, but yeah, so, so that, that's kind of the next step to kind of, you know, move back in the pipeline step by step and kind of add more of those difficulty prediction tools to our pipeline or wherever we see that, you know, it's, there's something that we don't understand or there are weird ad hoc parameters that you need to specify of which you don't know what to do, et cetera. But like indirectly, of course, everything you change in the beginning will then kind of affect the phylogenetic difficulty. Uh, I was wondering, uh, this, uh, like this here, for example, how will you generalize it? Like if I have a data set that it's, very specific in the sense that it, it's maybe a bit different to the training set. Is it possible to measure like how if my data set will work well for being predicted by PTA? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I showed you the, you know, the, the accuracy. So the accuracy prediction is, is, is very, um, is very good. And of course, you know, we did all the standard thing with cross validation when, when training it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
so I yeah I mean so far you, you know it has this very strong signal uh, with of the parsimony trees right um, maybe you know this is the um, this is basically the definition of difficulty let's see if I can remember it this is the pairwise or f distance between all trees um, well anyway. So, so basically, you know, we use the same metrics we use on the likelihood trees to define the ground truth difficulty, just use it by replacing them by parsimony trees, plus some other kind of features that don't play such a big role. So I, um, and, and the, the other thing is that, of course, so we have the ground truth difficulties, and we sampled, selected our data sets for training from tree base in such a way that they... Uh, reasonably well represent the difficulty distribution spectrum you get from tree base. So in general, I, I think this will generalize pretty well. So I'm, I would be very surprised if you, so that's a challenge, if you find like a data set where the prediction is maybe, you know, 0 0.1 off from the ground truth value as, as it is actually defined here. So I, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm very confident that it's, it's very accurate. Oh, those kind of, you know, classic kind of alignment filtering approaches where you throw out like a certain number of sites that have a lot of gaps. Yeah, I'm not, I've never personally never been really convinced that alignment filtering is necessary. So, um, like the one is more, more intuitive, you know, an intuitive argument that like my observation over the years has been that likelihood is just very robust to noise in general, right? Like you, we've done like tons of experiments where we inject errors in the alignment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or explicit like sequencing alignment error models that you incorporate into the likelihood model. And they never really made a difference. So we, you know, the, the, or the different was, difference was so insignificant that we never even thought about publishing the results of this model. Uh, so th this is like kind of a more intuitive argument, like empirical argument. And then there was also like a nice paper by Nick Goldman and some others where they actually show that it doesn't make any difference. And if you don't filter, like your phylogenetic accuracy will even be higher. I would have to look it up. Um, so I'm, I'm not convinced that you need it, but of course now you could do like a, you know, a simple experiment using those filtering approaches and then calculating the difficulty, which is very fast, of course, because you just infer some parsimony trees and like, you know, show, show if I'm right or wrong about my suspicion that filtering doesn't matter. And like, you know, the variance uh, that you will get, like in terms of difficulty will be kind of insignificant. So actually, yeah, why didn't we think about this? It's kind of an interesting experiment. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. But I. Is there a way of inferring a more coarse, uh, cross grained phylogeny in difficult cases? Like, I, I maybe removing, I guess. Yeah. Some... Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's basically what we do, right? So the, the argument there was that, like, if you have many. Uh, trees with more or less identical likelihoods, but very different tree topologies, you use summary statistics, right? And that's basically coarse grained, like the mo most straightforward way to do it is just to compute a consensus tree of all those different likelihood peaks. And then, of course, you, you lose resolution, but still, you know, you may get like some structure in some parts of the tree. Um, and that's basically it. It really depends if what are you, what you want to do downstream. If you're really interested in the tree, or maybe if you want to do species delimitation on the tree, right? So you just like, you don't take a single tree, but you take all 70 trees and run like species delimitation on those 70 trees in your probable and your plausible tree set, things like that. So it depends a little bit on your downstream idea. But, you know, the, what we did in this coronavirus paper was just to say, okay, so we just take all those trees, we compute a consensus tree, at least the parts of that consensus tree, which are resolved, that those are the parts that we trust. And the rest is just basically, you know, unresolvable. Essentially. Is there any other question? If not, I think we need to finish here. So thank you, Alex, again. Thank you very much.